Hello students, good morning. Welcome to EPG Patshala. Today we will discuss about the role of judiciary in environmental clearance. Friends, the constitution of India enshrines right to live with dignity as one of the founding principles of the constitutional governance. Right to live with dignity is incomplete without right to clean and healthy environment. In pursuance of the preambular goal of right to live with dignity, Article 21 recognizes right to life and its scope has been expanded by the Indian judiciary by including right to clean and healthy environment in its scope. So far as Article 21 is concerned, each individual enjoys right to life that covers right to clean and healthy environment. Besides Article 48A, which has been added by constitutional amendment in 1976, that imposes a duty or a kind of, it lays down a directive principle for the state to make and constantly endeavor for improvement in the environment. Therefore, state is under a constitutional obligation to protect the environment and improve the surroundings. It is not only the state, but also the citizens. Those are also under the obligation in the form of fundamental duties. Fundamental duties have been added in the Constitution by 42nd Amendment in 1976 and Article 51 AG that imposes a duty upon every individual in India to protect and improve the natural environment and have a compassionate approach towards the living creatures. So against this backdrop, this module has been designed to explain the role of Indian Judiciary in Environmental Clearance. The learning objectives of this module are to understand the judicial approach towards environmental clearance and to understand about the role of judiciary in applying principles of international environmental law in India. Besides, the purpose of this module is to explain and have an idea about the constitutional dictums and their linkage to environmental clearance. The module aims at gaining and imparting the knowledge on the challenges towards sustainable development and judicial approach thereon. So as discussed earlier, that articles 21, 48A and 51AG deals with environment. And if we look at the literal meaning of environment that includes water, air and land and the interrelationship which exists among and between water, air and land and human beings, other living creatures, plants, microorganisms and property. Therefore, this module has been divided into three main parts. First part covers the judicial approach towards environmental clearance that particularly deals with forest management and forest protection. In second part, we will discuss the contribution of Indian judiciary towards wildlife protection and management. In third part, we would deal with the contribution of judiciary towards urban issues and management further covering the problems relating to sanitation, solid waste management, and public spaces, park pavements, and town planning, and industrial zones. Friends, we would begin with the role and contribution of Indian judiciary in forest protection and management. Forests are the assets of a nation, and these are the main source of sustenance of life. 
to protect the forest and manage the forest cover since it has been decreasing despite the variety of India laws are in existence to protect the forest. But however, the forest cover was declining from last 30 to 40 years after independence. Therefore, the judiciary, while taking its proactive stance towards forest protection and management, T. N. Godavaraman Thirumulpat versus Union of India, that was a writ petition filed in 1995 and decided by the Honorable Supreme Court on, 90, uh, on 26 September 2005. Basically, the writ petition was based on three main questions. The first question, we can also say it fact in issue, that whether the user agency of forest land should not be asked to compensate the consequential losses of benefits accruing from the diversion of forest land for non-forest purposes. So, the opinion of the court in this matter was the user agency should be asked to compensate. And then the second fact in issue was whether the user agency should pay the net present value, net present value for diversing the forest land into non-forest purposes. And that net present value should be calculated on what basis? So, the court in this regard clarified that net present value should not be decided only on the basis of leaves and other derivatives from the trees in the forest, but also the benefits to be received from the forest in the long run. And the court made it categorically clear that forest is a basically public project and the assets of a nation as well as the future generations. So a benefit received presently may worth more than that is received later. However, the judiciary also gave a caution that it should be kept in mind that the benefit received today is decided on the basis of cost incurred today and time value of cash inflow or outflow is a very vital factor for the purpose of investment. Therefore, net, net present value is an instrument, it is a method, it is a kind of regulator to levelize the cost and strike the balance in ascertaining the benefit by taking note of various factors like value of rupee in present and 50 years later till that contract and lease for uh, extracting the forest produce is in existence and then rate of interest and rate of return after 50 years. And the third issue that was taken into consideration by the court in this matter was, is there any specific yardstick or a guideline to determine the net present value? And if yes, what shall be the extent of application of net present value and how to calculate it? Is there any need to exempt some projects from the payment of net present value. So the issue was responded on a positive note. The court also explained that the net present value should be calculated on the basis of public interest. Public interest should be the guiding principle. It is not the interest of the user agency. So revenue earning projects should be treated differently than non-revenue earning public welfare projects like government hospitals, dispensaries, and schools. The factors like regeneration and compulsory afforestation must be given adequate consideration while determining the net present value. Calculation of net present value to protect the environment, not to pay in lieu of proprietary rights, but also the interest of the future generations attached with those forest properties. Therefore, the court issued the direction to create separate funds and to ensure application of the principle of intergenerational justice in the forest, protect, uh, forest protection and forest management. Friends, 
our discussion would be incomplete if we do not discuss the contribution of judiciary through the case of rural litigation entitlement Kendra Dehradun versus Union of India, All India Reporter 1985 recorded on 652 of the Supreme Court portion. In this case, the question was the mining that is adversely affecting ecological envi and environmental order should be allowed in Masuri Dehradun Belt. Besides, this case is a very landmark case. Reason being, because this was the first case in the domain of environmental jurisprudence when the Supreme Court treated a letter as a writ petition. And treating this letter as a writ petition, questioning the mining in Masuri Dehradun Belt, belt in Uttarakhand, whether mining should be allowed, the Supreme Court taking note of the mining areas divided the areas into three categories. First, the categories falling under Masuri City Board limits and that required study of environment impact assessment. And second was whether it could be allowed. And now, so far as forest protection and management is concerned, we can summarize the contribution of Indian judiciary by highlighting a few judgments, like in T. Damodar Rao versus Special Officer Municipal Corporation, uh, the Supreme Court ordered to demolish the holiday home and cottage in reserve forest area made by LIC and Income Tax Department. And then came other case that is ARC Cement Limited versus State of UP where the Supreme Court ordered to shift a cement factory that was causing pollution in Dehradun, Dehradun region. And it ordered to shift that industry at the alternative site. And another case is where the court directed to discontinue the tendency to renewal of a lease by holding that renewal is not a vested right. If a new law or notification is issued that contains the instruction prior to, uh, that contains the instruction that where the state government, before it continues the lease, it should give, it should ensure that the prior concurrence of the central government is obtained. And if it is notified that the prior concurrence of the central government is required, then even in the existing lease, the state government cannot extend the lease. The mining in the forest area is prohibited. So this was laid down in Divisional Forest Officer versus S. Nageshwarama in 1996. In few of the matters, it has also been endorsed that while grant of lease in few of the state governments, there is a notification in state laws that for continuing the grant of lease in the forest area, prior approval of the central government is a condition precedent, means it is a prerequisite. So the absence of prior approval shall render a lease void. And it has been reiterated by several courts in India, including the Supreme Court and the High Courts as well, like in the case of Samantha versus State of Andhra, and then Nirmal Kumar Pradeep Kumar versus State of Bihar, then Bihar State Mineral Development Corporation versus State of Bihar, and so on. So, next case where the contribution of judiciary in context of uh, forest protection and management can be considered is that while permitting an industry based on forest produce, suppose these are the tendu leaves or any other forest leaves. So while permitting an industry that is based on the forest produce 
appropriate assessment should be made of forest wealth and it should be ensured that the ecology is being monitored. So, it was held in Samantha versus state of Andhra Pradesh in the year of 1997. Next is in context of minings, if the mining is allowed, whether the court can direct to ensure the safeguards and monitoring. In this context, once an issue was raised before the High Court of Himachal Pradesh, where the mining was held subject to certain safeguards as well as precautions. In the case of Journal Public of Sapru Valley versus State of Himachal Pradesh in 1993, in 1993, the High Court of Himachal Pradesh adopted a proactive approach and it allowed mining subject to certain safeguards and precautions. So, the thing is the court took a very bold stance that whether its judgments are being followed and implemented in the right perspective. There are few more instances where the court inclined to take follow up of its directions laid down in the in the cases. And then comes state of Himachal Pradesh versus Gneshwood Products Limited 1995. Here in this case, the industry uh, an enterprise which was permitted to carry on mining operations within the reserve forest or other forest area and the court held that it is duty of the leaseholder to ensure that forest does not become a menace to human existence or a source to destroy flora and fauna and biodiversity. So, in this way, the judiciary had always tried its best to protect and manage the forest resources. Then comes SR Oil Limited, Halar Utkars Smithy, which is also discussed in the domain of sustainable development, where it was held by the Supreme Court that area of a sanctuary or a national park declared under the respective laws cannot be allowed to be a network of pipelines of refineries. Then comes that the forest are the element of sustainable development. These are required to be protected by the strict enforcement of laws. The development and environment protection should go in harmony with each other. Therefore, a sawmill was banned. The activities which are against the natural environment and cause damage to the biodiversity in the forest, those should be banned. So, this was the case in Sardar Khan, son of Shri Jikar versus one Sanrakshak of 2005, where Allahabad High Court banned the operation of a sawmill in the forest area. Supreme Court has also applied in number of cases public trust doctrine to protect and manage the forest resources. In public trust doctrine, the Supreme Court has interpreted it like that the certain resources like air, sea, waters in the forest have such a great importance to the people as a whole that covers the present generation as well as the future generation. And it would wholly be unjustified to make them a subject of private ownership. These are the gifts of nature. These resources have to be enjoyed by present as well as future generations. So then they should be made freely available to everyone irrespective of the status in life. So, this was what the Supreme Court expounded in the case of M.C. Mehta versus Kamal Nath. Besides, the Supreme Court has also laid down that state should act as a trustee, trustee of all the natural resources which should be accessible for public use and enjoyment. So, public at large 
should be treated as the beneficiary of seashore, running waters, airs, forests, and ecologically fragile lands. The state as a trustee is under a legal obligation to protect the natural resources and make them accessible to everyone. This is also sometimes visualized and interrelated in context of Article 38 and 39 B and C of the Constitution of India, wherein it has been laid down that the state shall strive to make sure that the natural resources are available to all. So this was also laid down in Intellectuals Forum, Tirupati versus State of Andhra in 2006. So friends, in next part, we will deal with the contribution of judiciary in wildlife protection and management, where the court adopted some kind of scientific temperament and it went on to analyze the relation of various living creatures with each other. In state of Bihar versus Murad Ali Khan, it was in the year of 1989 when the Supreme Court took note of that the preservation of flora and fauna and some species which are on the verge of extinction. In this context, preservation should be taken as an urgent task for the survival of humanity. And the laws to protect environment should be implemented in the right spirit. The court acknowledged that the situation is very serious. And due to the gravity of the situation that has emerged from the long history of Quellus, an unkind and insensitive approach of the present mankind to the enormity of the risk to mankind that go with the deterioration of environment. So in this regard, environmentalist conception of the ecological balance in nature is based on the fundamental concept that nature is a series of complex biotic communities of which a man is interdependent. He is in part and parcel of this interdependent relationship between the natural creatures and it should not be given to be allowed to be trespassed and diminish as a whole. Then another case where the court expressed its anguish to protect the wildlife was World Wildlife Fund for Nature versus Union of India, where the court recommended that the forest protection forces should be upgraded. They should also be provided with the modern weapons to meet and to face the challenges posed by the smugglers. Then comes Sansar Chand versus State of Rajasthan, where the court emphasized upon the need to develop scientific understanding of nature, and in particular of ecological chain, wherein the linkage is very still primitive stage and incomplete and fragmentary. So the court explained the interrelationship between the frog and insects, snakes and frogs, and illustrated that how each of the living creature is necessary to maintain natural equilibrium. Then comes the matter of ivory traders and manufacturers association versus Union of India, wherein the government prohibited the trade in ivory and articles made from the ivory on ground of violation of 191G, the ban and the prohibition was challenged. The state government argued that this prohibition is justified since the sale of ivory by the dealers would encourage poaching and killing of elephants to replenish the stocks held by the petitioners. And the court, taking note of this lapse, made it categorically clear that the trade and business at the course of disrupting life 
in various forms and linkages cannot be permitted at the cost of biodiversity and ecology. We can summarize the contribution of judiciary in wildlife protection like in Pradeep Krishna versus Union of India in 1996, the Supreme Court held that the shrinkage of forest cover due to entry of villagers and tribals living in and around the sanctuaries and national park is not affordable. Then comes wherein the grant of licenses by the government to illegally mine in a reserve area and a sanctuary and a national park or any protected forest is contrary to law. So there are numerous cases where the state governments granted the license for the illegal mining and the courts quashed those license. Then comes Tarun Bharat Singh Alwar, Tarun Bharat Singh Alwar versus Union of India in 1992, where lease of a piece of land to a hotelier was declared ultra virus by Karnataka High Court in public interest litigation <coughs> by Nagrahol Bodakattu Haku Sthapana Samiti versus State. The next area where we can understand the contribution of the judiciary is urban issues and management. We would discuss the landmark case of Municipal Council Ratlam versus Vardichan, a All India Reporter 1980, decided by Supreme Court and recorded on page number 1622. In this case, a complaint was filed under section 133 of Criminal Procedure Code regarding the problem of nuisance caused by lack of proper sanitation facility where the field and staunch due to the lack of proper sanitation was causing a challenge to right to clean and healthy environment. And in this regard, the Supreme Court laid down a golden rule that financial constraint on the part of either the state government or the local bodies cannot be a ground for their failure, for justifying their failure in providing right to free from public nuisance. And this was the case where the Supreme Court also evolved the doctrine of sport visit where a Supreme Court judge himself visited from all the way from Delhi to Ratlam to inspect the site personally. Then the case was L.K. Kulwal versus State of Rajasthan where the complainants filed a complaint where it was asked that what is the amount filed by, what is the amount spent by the municipal corporation on cleanliness, drainage and sanitation. Well, the municipal corporation said they are not bound to disclose this information. And in this regard, it was held that the, if any public authority is not disclosing the information, it does not mean that they are authorized to do this. And a public authority can withhold the information from being disclosed only in the matters of national security and sovereignty but not in the matters of public interest. The public authorities are always under the obligations to disclose the information in public interest where the public interest is directly attached. So in this regard, the people have right to know that where the money is being spent by the public authority. So this was the first case where right to know or right to information was recognized by the Supreme Court through its means of dynamic interpretation. The next area where we can highlight the role and contribution of judiciary is solid waste management. Regarding solid waste management, the Supreme Court came across a matter in B.L. Vodera versus Union of India. 
in the year of 1996, where the pathetic conditions in the national capital of Delhi, pathetic conditions prevailing in national capital Delhi were in existence and the hospital waste was not being properly managed and disposed of and there was no landfill site identified by the government. So the court expressed its anguish over the excuse of non-availability of funds, inadequacy or inefficiency of staff taken by the municipal corporation and it endorsed the approach which was laid down by the Supreme Court in 1980 in the case of Ratlam municipality versus Vardichan and it repeated, reiterated that the ground of non-availability of funds or inadequacy or inefficiency of staff is not permissible by any public functionary to avoid their duty, their obligation to ensure right to clean and healthy environment. Then came the case of Almitra H. Patel versus Union of India, where the Supreme Court contributed to ensure that the solid waste is properly managed. However, it took note of the generation capacity of solid waste of the country that is 1,33,760 metric ton, particularly in the year of 2012-13, and it expressed its worry over that the problem may assume more serious level and it also condemned the apathy shown by the implementing mechanism and it acknowledged that there is a gap between the implementation of the policies and the government organs are getting failed. They are meeting failure throughout the country to properly dispose the solid waste. Therefore, the Supreme Court acknowledged that the indiscriminate dumping of such a huge amount of waste is going to pose a big problem and it would produce serious adverse impact on environment and public health. And the court recently, uh, the matter was also decided by Green Tribunal where it allowed, uh, where it uh, encouraged to adopt waste management rules of 2016 to ameliorate the situation by using humongous waste into a source of power, fuel and benefit for the society at large in consonance with the principles of circular economy. The Green Tribunal in this case of El Mitra H. Patel advocated processing of waste for the purpose of power generation and taking note of already failure in implementing the rules of 2016, the tribunal directed that now onwards, if any public authority is at failure in fulfilling the statutory obligations regarding solid waste management rules and that authority shall be held personally liable to be proceeded against in accordance with section 15 of Environment Protection Act 1986. And other area where we can understand and highlight the role of judiciary in context of environmental protection and management that is where the judiciary has ensured that the public spaces, parks, payments, town planning should be maintained. This was the case of Bangalore Medical Trust versus B.S. Mundappa in 1991, where the court quashed the order issued by the chief minister to convert a space reserved for public park into a nursing home. And Supreme Court held that the orders of chief minister are unconstitutional. Then came the case of D.D. Vyas versus Ghaziabad Development Authority in 1993, where Allahabad High Court came across that an area 
was already earmarked for public park under area development planning. But now that area was transferred to a hospital site and the court held this order of transfer as unconstitutional. Another area where in Rajasthan, in Nizam versus Jaipur Development Authority, Rajasthan High Court also quashed an area reserved for a public park, garden and lawn. It was allotted to a school management for the establishment of a school. And similar case again came up for the consideration of the Supreme Court in Virendra Gaur versus State of Rajasthan, where the Supreme Court set aside the allotment of a piece of land for the purpose of establishing a tannery, while that piece of land was reserved for a green area in the Urban Development Authority and the Supreme Court directed the Municipality Council to ensure that the constructed portion of tannery is demolished within the four weeks from the date of order and report to the Supreme Court. Besides, moving ahead, we can see the case of Delhi High Court, that is in Dr. G. N. Uh, Dr. G. N. Khajuria versus Delhi Development Authority, where the area of land was reserved for a park in residential colony, but Delhi Development Authority allotted this land for the construction of a nursery school, which was declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. So the last point of this module is that the Supreme Court ensured that the development and environment should go hands and hands together. So in this regard, it allowed the industries to be established in industrial area only. So where the industry is established in a residential area and it causes annoyance and nuisance to others, but as in case of Lakshmipathi versus state of Karnataka, the Karnataka High Court quest the establishment of such a sanction order to establish the industry and held that establishment of industry is in violation of the provisions of Karnataka Town and Country Planning 1961. And apart from it, the High Court declared that all such licenses and permissions are unconstitutional, null and void on account of contradiction with right to life guaranteed under Article 21 of the Constitution of India. Here, I would like to remind dear students that Rural Litigation Entitlement Kendra's case was where a simple postcard with an application was treated as a writ petition. And we understand that this case is considered as a landmark in the field of environmental jurisprudence. But however, due to the lack of poor people participation, post-decisional impact is still a very big challenge before the judiciary. So if people's participation is ensured, the environmental governance will improve. Finally, we can conclude that the judiciary has been striving hard to protect the environment, but the desired results have yet to be achieved. I hope the students have enjoyed this module. Thank you.